Coming up on DTNS, it's our listener co-host episode. Our supporters, our patrons have brought topics for us to discuss with them. Let's do it. This is the Daily Tech News Show for Tuesday, December 27th, 2022 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Welcome to our annual end of the year listener co-host show. This is the episode where we invite several of our supporters to appear right here on the show. And this year we invited some of our longest running patrons on board. Uh, we, we had a lot of folks who weren't able to make it, unfortunately, but we were lucky to get the following. Tim Jar, sysadmin from Madison, Wisconsin. Welcome, Tim. Thank you. It is uh, surreal to be here. <laughs> it is. It is surreal on both ends. Uh, Tim and I were talking about this before the show because I've I've been communicating with you across multiple shows by email and in forums and on Twitters and then things like that over the years. So it's really nice to to meet sort of face to face. Welcome, Tim. Thank you. We also have Anthony Marco, Ontario Region Labor Council representative to the Canadian Labor Congress. Anthony, welcome. It's great to be on the show. Uh, long-term supporter, long-term listener, Tom. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Anthony. I am also a fan of Anthony's shows, uh, the Marshall McLuhan Variety Hour and Best Episode Ever, uh, which he will be loath to plug, so I will plug them for him. <laughs> I'm, I feel I feel loath. <laughs> you should. Do you feel the loath tonight? Yes. <laughs> Uh, and finally, uh, you probably saw him recently on Daily Tech News Show, James Thatcher, a.k.a. Big Jim from thetradenerd.com and host of the Tech and Trade podcast. Welcome back, Big Jim. Thank you so much. Live from just outside of Hangar 18 at the Tech and Trade studio, uh, I'm Big Jim. Fantastic. Ah, what a wonderful panel. Indeed. So for this very special episode, uh, we've asked each of our listener co-hosts to bring a discussion, a tech discussion topic uh, that, you know, they thought we would all be able to kick around. So something that is interesting to the uh, co-hosts and interesting to everybody out there. Let's start things off with Tim. So Tim, your question is something for all of us, is it not? Yeah, as someone who's been in tech for a long time, and uh, the more you you deal with things, the more you uh, find your opinions are hardening around different ideas, and uh, sometimes they're not always the ones that, that the majority find to be uh, their opinion as well. As the more I listen to podcasts and broaden my horizons, I find that some of my opinions are. Uh, not as easily accepted by everyone or not universal as I thought. So I kind of wondered what everyone's view on what your, uh, what's your least popular or most controversial opinion within tech. Ooh, well, that's a good one. Um, big Jim, you want to, uh, what do you think? Oh, you want <laughs> you really want me to rip the bandaid off this one, Sarah? I don't know. I mean, it had to be somebody. Uh, you're going to hate me. I'm going to say it. Apple I know is what you're not say. That, yeah. Apple is not that great people, okay? Apple is not that wonderful. That's my least most controversial opinion I can give you. Yes. You know what's funny about that is it's not only your most controversial, but it's also your most popular opinion at the same time, <laughs> I, depending on who I, you're talking to, right? <laughs> I refuse to own any product from the house of job. Jobs. I, I don't. I have no Apple phones. I have no Apple tablets. I have no iHome. I have no iTV. I have no iQuisinart. What's I, iHome? I, he doesn't even know what the names of them are because he doesn't I, own them, Sarah. I, I refuse. I refuse. I walk away and I I go and get the holy water and bless the house with the cables right. to make sure All that right. it is not. No, honestly, here's the thing. Apple is a wonderful company when it comes to having product that is going to last for a long period of time. Very much high props for that. However, um, the stigma that everyone in the industry has that Apple is just, you know, you know you've made it when Apple copies your idea. It just, it infuriates me a little bit. Honestly, it just really infuriates me. 
Well, you uh, wouldn't we have... be alone. You wouldn't yeah. be Certainly alone, not. Tim. Yeah. Uh, Sir, uh, James, rather. Um, but yeah, but whatever. Tim, since you did ask the question, did you have an answer yourself? Well, there probably have been a lot through the years, and I, I have to laugh at Jim's because I have found myself the guy who, in Apple rooms, is defending Android and Google, and in Google rooms, I'm defending Apple all the time. So I, I, I am someone <laughs> who likes to play. In, yeah. I've always been one who likes to play in every environment if possible. So I've always had my music is in Amazon and Google and Dropbox, and you know, I uh, I'm a Windows sysadmin by day, but you can probably see I have a MacBook sitting here to my left that I do all my non-work stuff on when I'm working. Um, and to Jim's point, it's a 2011 MacBook that I still use every day. Mm -hmm. So that is that is impressive. But it there's is, stuff on yeah, it that if it drives works, me crazy, works. too. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I've, I've owned Android and iPhones, and I like to have a, a foot in every environment to know what it's like. But uh, the one that brought this to mind for me recently was it seems like in general everyone has uh, in the tech world has turned their back on wise after their security issues mm -hmm. and especially now after this past week with Yuffie's mm -hmm. issues coming to light and I was always a little uncomfortable with the fact that it is a Yuffie is owned by Anchor who has some questionable ties to the Chinese government and that makes me a little iffy on having cameras or home surveillance things from them. But uh, I had, I've spent a lot of my life working with engineers um, because the network guys are often right next to sysadmins and they come from more of an engineering mindset. I have engineers in my family and I kind of get how they, they tick in a different way than a lot of us. And Wise is a company of engineers. And uh, although I don't agree with everything that they said when they had their issues, I could 100% see engineers thinking that way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yeah. in the end, to exploit the, the problems they had, one, you had to have their Gen 1 hardware. So it was old, and that never impacted me. And it was it was Gen 1. You, that's some of what comes with that. And they had to be on your local network to exploit it. Well, if people are on your local network, you've already got a big problem. <laughs> so I have not thrown away my wise stuff, and I have, in fact, bought some additional but um, I also recognize the other side of those arguments of why some people have walked away from them. Totally. Well, Anthony, uh, we definitely want you to weigh in on this topic as well. Is there something in tech that you feel most people would find controversial? So I'll throw up my, my very short controversial one to start because this is my snarky one. Blockchain is not Jesus. That's my yes. first one. <laughs> but Preach. Preach. you don't say well, again again one that is also a popular and <laughs> depending on who you're talking to whether it's popular or controversial but, but my real my real one and i'm guilty of this myself is streaming music is artist theft mm. plain and simple mm. um i i grew up as a musician i played in every dive bar you know within probably you know, 50 miles of where I lived. And I use miles instead of kilometers, even though I'm up here in Canada. Um, but no, you've made we, Sarah very we, happy. We, we love now. you for this. <laughs> but yeah. um, it, it's it's plain and simple that artists just can't subsist on streaming. And nobody's going out and buying physical media anymore. There are great sites out there where you can actually support bands, you know, like Bandcamp and stuff like that, where if you jump on there, you can actually buy, uh, order a CD, get flack files, get whatever you want to, and actually directly support an artist. Uh, and I know that people empathize with artists uh, greatly when they hear about how many, you know, how many clicks it takes to make a, a few cents. Um, but so few of us are willing to actually do anything about it, including me for the most part. I'm not trying to assuage my guilt here. Um, as growing up a musician, I have a lot of friends who are professional musicians and they just, you know, it's almost impossible for them to get by these days. Anthony, yeah, I was going to ask, is that absolutist to you, Anthony? Because I am the rare bird who uses streaming media to figure out what CDs I'm going to buy. And, and I think that's great. I think if there's a follow-up step, I, I like, obviously this is a continuum, right? There's no on and off switch about this here. I mean, there's going to be some people who make it a point to go out and try and find new bands. And that's great. You know, I'll jump on, you go down a rabbit hole on YouTube and you might find five or six bands, but finding physical media is getting tougher these days um, because it's not worth it to the artist to only sell 50 copies of a CD. And so that is taking 
another, you know, another revenue source away. It's, you know, when quantity of scale means that you have to order a thousand CDs in order to make some kind of profit on them. Um, some artists aren't even doing that anymore because they can't even guarantee that they'll sell a thousand. Well, I mean, definitely I would agree with this to an extent that, you know, if you look at like friend of the show, Mike TV, Get Set Go, obviously, yeah, you stream his music, he's making pennies if, if, he, if he's lucky. Um, but you get into the bigger artists like Taylor Swift and Beyonce and these types of people. And I think there's a real classist kind of attitude towards streaming of music. And we, I, I think you're right. I think you're absolutely right that, that we need to look at a different way of funding these artists. Otherwise we're not going to have artists. Yeah. I was just going to say, like, I think the, the Patreon model, let's say, is not bad it solves a certain problem but there's so many people who and I, I i don't know what the percentage is like they often say that if you had fifty thousand devoted fans you could probably subsist off of something if you're an artist uh, if you're a music artist you could tour around to major cities you'd sell mm -hmm. enough units all that kind of stuff mm -hmm. um but ultimately uh they could be making so much more and that's the reality of it and so uh, so yeah. as much as i criticize the concept i mm, yeah, i do it myself <laughs> at all the right, same Sarah, time I... I... oh go ahead tim I hope it never goes away because I have gained so many artists in my collection. In fact, the fun thing I do every every year this time of year at Christmas is I load up all the new Christmas releases in Spotify or Apple Music or whatever and pick out the tracks you that I'm going to go been there buy. With us the other day talking about oh, our yeah, I had, Christmas songs. I had many opinions on your opinions. <laughs> <laughs> But I will always buy at least the MP individual MP3s, if not a couple of new albums every year from what I've found on streaming media. So it's, I would I, lose it. I think it's worth pointing out a couple of things. First of all, uh, I, I don't know that Anchor has any more uh, a, a association with the Chinese government than other Chinese companies. I, I assume yes. that's just what you meant is that they, they are based in they China. Have, they have yeah. some. Uh, and, and then, and that, uh, Anthony, to your point, uh, revenue, music revenue has been rising under streaming. Uh, so it may not be the streaming that's the issue. It may be the royalty structure. Would that be fair to say? Yeah, no, I, it definitely put it this way. If the amount of people who were listening to a band were actually listening to a band the way we used to listen to bands, which was either on the radio where they would get, uh, way more of a cut for a radio play than they'd ever get for a streaming play or actually buying a physical piece of media, um, then they would be then they would be getting more. Um, however, admittedly, if you get 10 million streams on something, you might get more than one radio play. So I, I guess it depends where people are moving and what kind of music you perform. If you perform classical music, maybe the streams aren't as high. I don't know. And uh, the other thing I'll point out is, man, uh, K-pop artists sell a lot of physical media. Like. <laughs> That that's uh, it, it's it's kind of crazy. Uh, as as my wife and I have gotten more familiar with that industry, the number of of box sets and CDs and seasons greetings packages, and so I think I think artists can can look to that as well. The um, same is before, true for the same is true for J-pop and J-rock too. Yeah, yeah, that there's makes a sense. lot of of physical media, and it, I, I was shocked that you could get you know you know. Uh, albums just good old-fashioned yeah. vinyl albums out of some j-pop people so i, mean, I just bought taylor swift's album like on vinyl yeah i mean they're they're lovely mm -hmm. i mean they're i can't pretty. think of anything more fun than like <laughs> buying a vinyl album being like yay okay how do i play it <laughs> now but uh, i love it sarah you and i have not answered tim's question ourselves do we need to do we need to fess up um, oh, I, I can do this uh, quickly. I would say that, I don't know if it's controversial, but I, I am a big VR person. Um, I was very not into VR for the last, I don't know, let's call it three years that VR was sort of being floated around as like the next big thing. I was like, ah, VR, ugh, who cares? Um, I'm very much into it now. I think that uh, there's a lot of stuff that has to be, I guess, proven. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not even really talking about the metaverse uh, because that is, that's its own thing. And VR and AR would be a big part of that. Um, but I, I, I will say that once I tried a VR experience for the first time, I was like, Oh, this is real fun. 
Um, so a lot of folks say, eh, not the future. I say, mm -hmm. probably is. Don't know exactly how we're going to get there, uh, but that's 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 what I would that's what I would bet on. Gotcha. Uh, I would say that I try very hard to make Daily Tech News Show a place that is not about outrage. It's about understanding. It's about a, a place that uh, we we try not to just feed controversies unnecessarily. Uh, but I think because of that, my most controversial take is that things aren't that bad. Uh, anytime I, I try to like undermine, like, hold on, this this particular vulnerability is not as pe bad as people are making, or this practice of social media is not undermining the entire world as much as, as people think, I get the most backlash when I try to do that. So I, I feel like that's what, probably- Because people want you to say that it is that bad? Yeah, because they're like, no, you're okay. underplaying it. it. It is that bad, and you're, gonna, you're making it worse by pretending it's not bad. When I'm not pretending at all, I'm just trying to to give a you know right. my yeah. honest opinion on things. So, people want the outrage. They want the outrage. They want the anger. Yeah, they I don't suppose recent news around Twitter has made you think of that by any chance, has it? I mean, sure, that's just the most recent. Uh, you, right. the, this stretches back to Facebook in 2016 yeah. and Apple every day <laughs> for <laughs> 15 years. So mm -hmm. yeah, you, you you're, you're also you're also serving a, a listenership which has a siloed lens towards tech, obviously. And so sure. it's something they truly care about. And so to them, it's not necessarily insubstantial. It's more substantial than the general population would be. And I, yeah. I, I like the fact that you're trying to bring you're trying to bring it from outside the silo. You're trying to say like, most people probably don't care so much about mm -hmm. this, <laughs> but I know you who are listening, you care well, a I lot think about yeah. it. Probably everybody on this panel kind of, you know, we're probably the most techy person in our family slash friend group, you know, so we're used to this. Um, not everybody is though, uh, and, you and know, and also and digging into digging into it uh, a story more past the headline to be to be like yeah this is a vulnerability but you know what it's it's email and addresses not passwords uh, that were leaked and and that doesn't mean to say it's a it's a good breach but let's let's be proportional and understand you know rather than always going to to a hundred percent anger on every single thing out there. And I will say that's one of the things I have valued most about DATNS through the years is oh, thanks, man. you don't go to extremes, whether you yep. or Sarah or any of the regular contributors. Except for the rare times we do. And then it's yeah. <laughs> well, that one person. But yeah, but yeah. We, do, we, uh, we, we actually do, we try really hard to do yeah. exactly what you're talking about. So thanks for noticing. No, I appreciate um, that. Yeah. No, we, it, it, we, it stands we, out. We really don't, you know, really we, we try to stay away from the sensationalism look the only sensation the, the only sensational thing that dtns has ever come out with is hashtag portal to hell hell portal i mean that's this <laughs> far that's a far about as far sensational as this has ever you gone have to, but i have had heated arguments with justin about that exact topic <laughs> sure sure i'm sure you have <laughs> all right let's all? uh let's uh get here from anthony anthony what is your topic you would like us to discuss Sure. So, I mean, I come from a, uh, a labor activist background here in Canada, and one of the things that we've been trying to pass policy on here over the last couple of years, and it's still a far way away if we can do it, is b based on this question. As companies continue to replace workers with robots and other automation, the personal income tax base uh, funded by a lot of those workers, sometimes hundreds and thousands of them in single locations, which funds social services, they're being eroded, and tax to GDP ratio is collapsing across certain parts of not only in my country, but the United States and in certain states. So do we need to consider a boosted tax regimen for companies who replace workers with technology? Ooh. So, this is interesting because it's yeah. similar. There's a similar conversation happening over automated cars, right? Mm -hmm. That that if, or, or I'm sorry, electric cars. Not auto. Not I. I brought automation in when I didn't need to. Uh, electric cars that don't use gas and and gas taxes fuel the roads, uh, fuel the 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 repa repair of the roads. And so there's a lot of talk of like, okay, do we need to tax electric vehicles uh, in order to help fund road repair because we're not getting the money from the gas tax that, that we got from cars before? I hadn't thought about it in this particular way of like, oh yeah, you're now not withholding tax from a worker with a robot. Now, the question I guess would be, uh, are we seeing a reduction in the labor force 
uh, because of automation. And it could, because if you still have the same number of people working, presumably they have the same tax contribution. So would this have to be premised on a either a reduction in the labor force or a, a reduction in overall wages, I guess, even if it's the same number of people working? Uh, is, is that presumed in this? So the reduction that we're seeing here and the shift that we're seeing here is we're going from what used to be career permanent jobs to more precarious jobs. Um, so for instance, if you if a big company, company X opens up a warehouse in, in your town, you expect there might be a couple thousand jobs there, depending on how big it is. And they're going to be full-time jobs. In fact, company's going to stay there for a long time. They're going to be employing a bunch of people and it might go on for a long period of time. So you've got yourself a stable employment. You may get some ancillary jobs which come out of, I'm the person who now fixes the robots and the person who fixes the automation, but that's not going to be near as many people as you'd have working there. And so this company that has come to your town, set up this, you know, perhaps monolithic structure uh, on the outskirts of town, you would expect every day you're going to have a couple thousand workers coming in and out of there on shifts and you're not anymore. And so people are having to make up those jobs with precarious work, whether that's the gig economy, whether mm. that's um, other jobs, maybe two or three part-time jobs slapped together. And those two or three part-time jobs aren't going to have benefits, aren't going to have a pension, aren't going to have a lot of security that a full-time job would have. I, I wonder if if down the road there are other things that happen that make more stable jobs happen but that is something that is nebulous right uh i think a an yeah, interesting like what would those be well yeah exactly and and the reason i say that is in the past every time we feared automation eliminating jobs other types of jobs were created and they were jobs that we didn't understand would be stable jobs before they were created so it's kind of impossible to say now and that's why it gets really nebulous but i think what what is a a a part of what anthony's saying that you could put your hands on even if you're like well but i think i think the marketplace will take care of it is that warehouse that he's talking about uh and, and and tell me if this jives with what you're thinking anthony that warehouse may have gotten tax breaks that warehouse may have had particular infrastructure created by the city uh for it and now suddenly that warehouse is no longer contributing the taxes that it was supposed to contribute through employee payroll tax uh because they automated sure and and let's face it i mean going back to uh as far as like 1968 in the u.s i'll I'll use a u.s example the corporate tax rate was 52.8 percent Now, those were the times going back in the 50s and 60s that a lot of people consider the golden years of growth and the economy and post-war and all that stuff. Uh, It has certainly gone down since then, and it has plummeted since then. The first uh, first years of the Trump administration, it it dropped by 5%. And so, you know, are you seeing uh, tax rates that are still out there? Sure. But here's another problem is corporate tax loopholes have, have... Uh, expanded hugely because the concept of a multinational corporation 50 years ago certainly existed, but not to the degree it does today. Um, You know, all of the siloing of different corporations under one roof means that you can use a lot of tax dodges to avoid paying taxes at all. And it would be one thing if everyone was benefiting from this. But ultimately, we've seen and we see the gap between the wealth and the poorer people across not just Canada, but the United States getting wider and wider and wider. And there are some places that don't have drinking water that you can drink anymore. I mean, we're losing social services hand over fist. But th- those are all true, whether you've got robots involved or not, I, I, I think you would say. I, I, well, I mean, put it this way. This is, a, this is a big contributor to it, because if you have less and less people who are paying income taxes and people in the gig economy oftentimes aren't paying income taxes because they're getting paid under the table. Mm. Um, so whether you're doing food delivery, sometimes you, even if you're working as a service worker in a restaurant, you know, you're taking home tips, but you're not claiming taxes on them, stuff like that. So there's a lot of personal income tax that doesn't get pulled. And it's not my ideal situation that we should be paying for all of this stuff through personal income tax. That's not the ideal at mm. all. I certainly think the corporate tax rate should in places be uh, lifted up as well. Be, yeah. Yeah. Do we see a drop in income tax being paid either in Canada or the U.S.? Um, put it this Personal way. Personal income the, tax, I mean, not yeah, corporate. I, I mean, cu- every every single politician, whether you consider them left or right, is going to campaign on lowering taxes. Like, it never used to be that mm. way. It was like, we're going to, we're even, even the most left politicians or party politicians, let's say, in Canada, like the new Democratic Party here in Canada, which is the closest thing we have to, you know, the Democrats down there, they're even going to get up and they're going to say, we're going to reduce taxes on you. And, and everyone says, great. Yes, we everyone says, great, because they think of themselves. And I, yeah. I, I get that. I completely get that. But when infrastructure is crumbling around you, uh, like hundreds of millions of dollars in some cities with 
with streets and sewers and pipelines and all of that stuff, and you start to see sinkholes popping up all over the place. Um, it's don't get me wrong. This isn't an isolated case. All a lot of this stuff is interconnected. Um, but certainly this is contributing to it. I'm one of those types of people who, when I walk into a store that has self checkout, I don't work there. I'm not doing self checkout. I'm going to the one person who's behind the counter, who's actually getting paid to do the job. Are you worried that the robots will rebel if we tax them? <laughs> well, if they do, then we're, we're screwed. I mean, first of all, they're going to, <laughs> So we have to figure out how to mitigate. Sarah's well, like, let's not, whoa, whoa, whoa. let's not waste time answering the question. <laughs> might, like, might not happen let's today, prepare. but yeah. they're going to. Right. First of all, we need to figure that out. First of all, we need to pay the robots to tax <laughs> the robots. All right. So we kind of have to delay the their robots rebellion. In order for the robots to get angry enough to rebel. Well, Got it. okay. Yeah. So first, for the, we're diving into one of the topics that I didn't want to get into, which was at what point are we going to agree that robots and AI are, are we have to, are we ready for them to have self, self-awareness and are we ready to not treat them like slaves? But moving past that point for a moment, <laughs> that's a slippery slope that we'll just save for next year's episode. Um, I guess the way that I look at it, Anthony is, you know, we're going to get to the point where obviously income tax is not going to be the preferred method of revenue for a, 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 a government, regardless of the size, right? We're going to get to that point because we've got multiple streams of revenue coming in from multiple different locations and you're not going to be able to grab that. Um, does that mean we go to a value added tax like you have in Canada? Not necessarily. Does that mean we need to hire, make a higher corporate tax? I don't know. Perhaps we shouldn't give so many tax incentives. Um, but that also being said, I see us going in this rep, in this model to a usage tax. Um, you know, Tom, you brought up the point. What, how are we going to deal with all these gas taxes that we used to pay for roads mm -hmm. when their car is not using gas anymore? I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, Tom, it was like three or four years ago. I want to say it was Washington State was proposing looking at a per mileage rate for taxing vehicles. I think it was Washington State. It might have been Oregon. Um, one of those states was looking at this a while ago. And they ended up not doing it because there was a revolt of people. Now it might change because yeah, it was Washington. Not, I, I looked yeah. it up and checked. Yeah, no, you're right. Yeah. And, and, and I, I think we might get to that point now where we aren't going to tax the vehicle itself. We're just going to say, okay, every mile you drive, you pay a quarter of a penny or whatever equivalency because you're using a public road. And because we have electric vehicles and everything's automated and we can tell where you've been and everything else, maybe not necessarily tracking you individually, but saying, okay, they're inside a, this zone. So that means they're on city streets or they're in this zone. So they're on state roads or they're in this zone. So they're on a highway. Um, I, I could see us moving towards that. I could see us using, moving towards more usage fees than necessarily income fees, but. And that, that could be an automation that could be applied to automation in a factory mm -hmm. setting as well, potentially. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering right. at some point, considering that uh, corporations are considered persons in many ways under uh, under U.S. law and under Canadian <laughs> law, I'm wondering if the robots end up being the children of those persons. Oh, well, and a custody it gets into battle. Where... And we can have oh, child man. labor laws. <laughs> is it, is it, people. Is it the corporation that owns them? Or is the corporation that's the parent? Or is it the builder that's the parent? Or is well, it it's, it's, called the software it's gonna be that's robots, the parent? It's going to be robots as a service. So the company that owns the factory doesn't own the robots. They're leased from a company that is also a shell company of a paper company in the Bahamas that is run by SPF. It's probably. very, very, probably. very easy yeah. and clear. Yeah. 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 Just yeah. be aware of the three laws. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> they're God, laws. I hope they're programmed. God, I hope they're programmed in. <laughs> as the guy who is the... Uh, the Apple Defender in in Google Rooms and vice versa. I'm also often the the blue voter in red states and red voter in blue states or whatever you want to categorize that as. But I've also always often found myself in the minority there. And as Anthony said, selling higher taxes is is a hard sell for any any candidate. But I wonder if we could reshape it to you know we always hear the example of everybody feared spreadsheets were going to kill accountants. Yeah, yeah. Would not be used. 
but it uh, freed them up yeah. to do other things, or they were retrained to do other things in the, in the enterprise. Okay. What if there's some sort of tax incentive for when you automate certain jobs, retraining those users retraining. for other things? Yeah, so that so that you're providing more of a safety net to make a transition to something else without throwing everybody into gig work. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I grew up in Flint. Kind of I saw what happened when the auto industry went down and everybody who depended on those jobs lost their lost their income. Yeah, because that, that's where my head's at, honestly. I, I worry less in the long term that automation is going to take all the jobs. Uh, I worry about the transition uh, depending on how fast automation comes. And it's going to come faster in some areas than others. And those areas are going to need a better transition plan. So, um, at least in the U.S. right now, it's very hard to sell punishment on anything if, mm. if you reshape it as some sort of incentive. Yeah, unlike those other countries that love punishment. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I guess the question, though, too, is... With, the U.S. With, is bad at so many things. Punishment, add to the list. Yeah. With a worldwide labor force now, too, you can guarantee that even though you might say that there could be a ton of jobs in creating automation and building automation, um, because of wages, those jobs probably aren't sticking anywhere in North America. I can tell you that much. Yeah. Uh, uh, you'd the... be surprised. Being the supply chain guy on this channel right now, uh, <laughs> I'm going to tell you right now, you would be surprised how many companies are, are looking at close shoring and short shipping uh, a lot of their sourcing right now to Mexico, to parts of Canada, Northern uh, Saskatchewan area is one of the areas I know that some people are looking at building uh, warehousing and R&D investment because those areas have a, a lot of area. They've got money enough to be able to support that kind of an atmosphere. Um, we've also seen a lot of movement in the Caribbean lately uh a lot of the 583s are looking at reopening back up which is surprising to those of us in retail so what's a 583 so back in the old days you would take um a, a fashion apparel and you would maybe produce your 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 fabric for your shirt in the u.s you'd send it down to uh let's say uh uh think of a country guatemala there. guatemala well, not even Guatemala. I would even say, uh, let's say Honduras. You'd send it to Honduras, and they would cut it, trim it, and make it look nice, and then send it back up. That country would then it would come back as duty free under what was called the 583 program. Uh, okay. That gotcha. got replaced by Caribbean Free Trade Agreement. But once China opened up and no longer was required to have visas anymore, everybody fled to China. So, mm -hmm. you know, now I when think it's starting to slingshot back. When you when you see this kind of reshoring happening, uh, do you also see prices rise for you, or is it about the same? Is it lower? So we're I cannot speak for all of the companies out there. I can speak for Darn it. Uh, my my experience with my companies that I work with and consult with and or work of for directly. Um, what we're seeing is it's a trade balance. You know you're. But they are becoming these countries are becoming more attractive again, because mm -hmm. not necessarily because ocean freight rates uh, went up and now they're coming down again. That's not the issue. The issue is with inflation, that plays such a balance that people can kind of play the tag game mm. with the inflation of the value. Um, I think that's going to be helpful uh, to looking at short shoring. Um, now, the other side of this is also cost of inventory. And if you ask anybody right now in retail, hey, do you have any inventory just laying around? They'll show you warehouses and warehouses of inventory because we all overbought. Um, so, and that's no secret in the industry. Everybody knows that. Uh, so I think short shoring enables us to have shorter amounts of inventory, quicker turn time. Maybe it costs a little more, but it's way cheaper than paying that inventory tax at the end of the year. I see. So it may it may cost more in some ways, but it reduces other costs. So Correct. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's a balancing act. It's a balancing huh. act. Well, folks, if you want to talk to any of these fine people, they are patrons. Uh, you might find them hanging around in our Discord, uh, and you can talk to all kinds of cool, uh, fun folks in there as well. You can join that by linking your Patreon account at patreon.com slash DTNS. All right. Well, um, all of our guest hosts have brought a topic. So, Big Jim, why don't you bring us on home? What is your topic? Uh, you know, it's we're going into 2023, and I just <laughs> no, want to know. We really are, weirdly. 
Dragging away. 2023. Kicking and screaming. We're going into 2023. <laughs> yeah. I just want to know where's my jetpack? Where's my hover car? Yeah. Where's the where's, question? Where's my Rosie the robot? Have you seen my house? Where is my robot that comes in and actually picks up stuff? Not the little vacuum that goes around in circles. I mean, that, don't get me wrong. Those are cute and all. I need something to pick up after my kids. Um, wh- wh- what happened? Why are we not there yet? We were promised jetpacks. No, I'm yes. with you on this. I want my hoverboard from Back to the Future 2. I want my hoverboard. Yeah, yeah. Ooh, uh, tough stuff. Uh, I don't really have an answer for you, but I I, I feel your pain. Um, I see you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I see you saw I feel, I feel your pain. Yeah, I haven't, right. I haven't seen the new Avatar, but I'm sure it'll make me cry. Um, but yeah, I... I don't know. I mean, there are a lot of things as far as autonomous vehicles or, you know, robots that are, you know, helping people in a real way outside of a Amazon warehouse. I mean, we're, we're not there yet. Um, mm-hmm. Turns out takes a while for everything, you know, not only the technology to be capable, but for the people who want that technology to then say, yes, this is the way that I wanted it in the first place. But I think sir, you know, there's a lot ten, going on. But sir, we're only 10 years away. We're only 10 years away. From That's fusion. what we say. Yeah. That's what we say. Every, we're only 10 years We've away. We've said that for the last 30 years. So that's my that's my point. <laughs> I, I, I think this question is fun uh, because, you know, we all want jetpacks. We all saw the Jetsons. We you know, we want hover cars. Uh, we want Rosie the robot who can go beep, beep, beep. Yes, Mr. Jetson. Uh, I I think I love how the Jetsons is like, that's what we want. Right. The well, Jetsons. that's usually what people go to when they think sure. about jetpacks yeah, and hover cars. It's, right. You know, yeah. It's, futuristic. it's the template. Yeah. Where were the Jetsons smartphones? Yeah. I was going to say video calling was the thing I remember hearing most about growing up. It was a complete impossibility until it was a day-to-day mundane Until it's thing mundane. Until pe- people dismiss it now, right? I don't even Whereas think our video call that. would have been in this conversation until uh, suddenly Skype and then later FaceTime come along. And now people are like, oh, yeah, fa- just FaceTime me. Like it's... Yeah. Like, my, we my, don't even think about it. Yeah. My parents are almost in their 80s and they understand FaceTime. They barely understand email, but they can make a FaceTime call to me like it's nothing. And that is amazing. The fact and, that we've got the fact that we've got FaceTime now, the last thing I want to do is see somebody when I talk. To them. <laughs> like, to be honest with you, like I don't people, want to do either of them. I don't, don't want to talk FaceTime to them. Me. Just text me. Just text Good me. Grief. And I, that's that's what I want. I was just saying, I, I watched a video not too long ago, and it's probably been up for years, but it was a Neil deGrasse Tyson talking ans- answering this question. And then he basically said, uh, you have flying cars, they're called helicopters. And, and they might not be exactly what you asked for, but because of the requirements of down thrust to actually get a flying car, you got I don't know, man. They had helicopters know. when the Jetsons was being made, too. I don't think that's what they meant. What was the name of that car, Tom, that was like, that was, the guy was making outside of California? You know what I'm talking about? The one that yeah, had I the do. thrusters on the sides, and it was supposed to be able to have, they were going to have a two seater and a four seater. The uh, molar. molar. The molar. molar. Thank, Thank you, you, Roger. Roger. Molar. I want my molar car. You know why? Because I don't like sitting in traffic for 40 minutes trying to come home. Oh, I do. Why don't you? <laughs> I think it's I, so fun. I have a corollary. I actually to don't really sit in traffic ever because I work from home. But anyway. I have a corollary to Jim's question. It's 2023. How does network printing still suck just as badly as it did in 1995? Oh, God. Oh, man. Oh. Tell me about it. I, oh, I'll be God. honest. I'll be honest. I, I, I am 100% behind you, Tim, that, that network printing is, is still way more frustrating than, than it should be. I do. I am able to print over Wi-Fi now. Mm. Like, it. It doesn't yes. always work. A lot of times I have to go check on it. Maybe I have to, you know, hit a button, turn it on, turn it off again. I used to not be able to get it to work at all. And so Why I, 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 I think it's raised from like 20% reliability to 90, uh, 60% reliability. Yeah. I want to know why I can print. It's still terrible. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I want to know why I can print over Wi-Fi faster than my network connection. 
Well, that I can't tell you. Yeah. Yeah. That makes no sense at all. <laughs> if I send, if I send something can. from my cell phone to my printer it, it, and it's going through the same network connection. Probably it, a different protocol, some, right? I guess. I don't know, it, but it's it, it's faster. It just spools up and goes. Yeah, so, it's, so it's using a different protocol. It'd be my guess. Tim might have an answer. I would guess that. I, uh, thankfully, I have moved out of desktop support. But I still <laughs> Congratulations. That's well said. No, what, no wonder no you seem so problem. calm. I yeah. am no longer going to answer this question, but I appreciate you asking. <laughs> I hear you complaining. But I also can sleep well now. So, yeah. so Tom, Tom, were your comments saying that it's not as bad as it really as we're making it out to be? Is that what you were saying? <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> this is the exception that proves the rule right here. I just stopped printing things. Printing yeah. is a nightmare. It's never worked. Oh, hey, I you're saving trees. Good, good for you. Exactly. Oh. Yeah. Look at me. Yeah. Look at the world no, of compliance. I, we we have to. We don't have a choice. I really do think that these sorts of things. We always imagine a future that isn't really the future we want. Exactly. Right. There, there are things that because if you take take video calls. The video calls of the future that you would see in the 60s and 70s were always these huge single purpose machines that were installed in the living room and you had to sit down at them and then press the buttons through the one phone company uh, and get the video call. Uh, I think what we have with smartphones is much better than what we imagine. So a lot of times tech gives us a better version of what we think we want. Sometimes we don't we don't really want it uh it turns out it's just not something like i think jetpacks are really cool i'm not sure how practical they are because they exist and you don't see a lot of people using them um and then there, then there's things that just you know they're they're harder to make work uh than than you think and that uh, that's where the flying cars are i think yeah yeah i also i also think that I was going to say, I also think that if COVID proved anything, it proved that people can work from home. And if companies actually have the level of trust that they probably need with a lot of their employees to work from home, it starts to ease the demand mm. for requiring a flying car. If we actually had employers who trusted 50% of their workforce to do the work that they did during COVID from home to instead or to keep doing it from home, uh, you might not actually need you know, the traffic tie ups that you need, like we have two to three hour commutes going into the city of Toronto, coming from and I live about an hour away in good traffic, in bad traffic, it's two to three hours and people live mm -hmm. further away than me and they, they make the commute back and forth every single day. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I yeah. live in an area of the Bay Area that is uh, similar to that. And I don't know how they do it. <laughs> really don't. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, folks, uh, if you've got thoughts on this, we would love to hear them. Uh, keep them coming because we'll be doing uh, going back to live shows in a couple of days here on January 3rd. So feedback at DailyTechNewsShow.com. Uh, thank you so much. Indeed. And also thank you so much to our fun panel today. Um, <laughs> bring in the knowledge, everybody. Tim, let's start with you. Where can people keep up with your work? Uh, I don't have anything real exciting to promote there, so you can find me on the DTNS Slack or maybe the Discord if I get around to installing that. Well, excellent. Uh, we're, we're glad to have you. Um, and if you see Tim, do say hello. Um, it was such a pleasure to have you. Anthony Marco, also such a pleasure. Let folks know where they can keep up with you. Sure. You can find me uh you can find me still on Twitter for the time being at Anthony Marco. Uh, no fake name there. And since Tom was so nice to uh, to promote my podcast earlier, I think uh, you should all go listen to East, East Meets West with Tom uh, and Roger. Uh, <laughs> excellent. It's somewhere at subbrilliant.com, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. It's, it's EMW. where Tom and Roger fight, and it doesn't upset me. And you can find all my podcasts <laughs> at anthonymarco.com. They just do that over there. <laughs> awesome, Anthony. Well, thanks for being with us. James Thatcher, a.k.a. Big Jim. Uh, good to have you as well. Let folks know where they can keep up with you. Well, you can always follow me on the DTNS Discord, which if you're not there, why aren't you there? We're having yeah, a ball why? over there, man. Uh, and also you can find all of my rantings and ravings on Twitter at jthatcher79. If I'm around, if I'm not around, which is most likely because I'm on the Discord, you can find me at tradenerd.com. Or if you really want to know what goes in my brain, you can buy my book, To Love Me or Not, Global Logistics Haiku's Views from the Inside at logisticshaiku.com. I mean, I, there's a, not a book. I want to buy more than that. I have my copy right here. 
Absolutely. Of course you do, because that's how you are. Can you go here? No space to L.A. We can route you to Houston, warehouse in Chino. Yep. You, re you really just cannot curveball Tom. He has it in the uh, bookshelf behind him. So. Well, I, I was going to pull out my meta device here just a little bit ago when you were talking about <laughs> VR, but I figured nice. that, would be, that would be outdoing Tom on his own show. No, never. No, the fair. more the merrier. It's Mine all are good. Over there. They're over there. I swear. <laughs> just uh, off, off camera. Folks, we have the best, as you can tell, we have the best listeners in all of podcasting uh, right here. Thanks to everyone who supports the show. This show happens because of all of you. Uh, we cannot do it without you. You are welcome to join us. Don't feel like, oh, those those folks, I could never be part. No, come on in. Join us right now. DailyTechNewsShow.com slash Patreon. Speaking of patrons, we don't have live shows this holiday week in the U.S., but we are normally live Monday through Friday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern. That's 2100 UTC. You can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. But we're going to see you tomorrow with our special reminiscence show where Tom, Roger, and I share how we all met and how it was working at Tech TV and beyond. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>